Walter, thanks for doing this. Pleasure. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> We're, done. We're fast. We're done. Um, I've never actually talked to anyone who got into theater through wrestling. And I believe you work with Gorgeous George on a wrestling circuit. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. I, uh, I was Gorgeous George's valet on his last tour. And uh, he, was, he was so wonderfully theatrical. Uh, I picked him up at the airport and on my way, uh, taking him to his hotel, he said, where does your mother get her hair done? And I said, I don't know. He said, well, can we stop and ask her? And so we stopped at the house and he asked her, wonderful gentleman. And then he phoned the beauty parlor and said, uh, I'd like to make an appointment for three o'clock in the afternoon. Thank you. Yes. Then he phoned two newspapers and said, gorgeous George is going to be getting his hair done at such and such a place. So down we went and there are photographs, photographs. Then he said, kid, take me up to where we're, we're doing the match. So I took him up to the CLB Army. And he found a place, the furthest point away from the rink, had his own little record player with an amplifier, which he plugged into the PA system. And he played the Pomp and Circumstance Overture for his entrance. And I walked on <coughs> with a silk cushion with an atomizer on it in front of him. He had another kid holding on to his train as he walked on. We got to the ring. I stepped aside to let him get up, and he went, and indicating for me to go into the ring. And I said, what? He says, I had to go in and atomize the opponent who smelled, obviously. <laughs> and I kept saying, no, no. And he kept saying, yes, yes. Finally, I got in there, went over and did that to the guy. And the guy just laid me out. Then George came into the ring and the savior and just cleaned the guy. <laughs> and this is all before the match starts. So that, uh, that was a great piece of theater. So great you piece. learned theatricality, you learned <laughs> marketing, <Yeah>. and you <laughs> learned how not to get out of the way of a... <laughs> and how to take a fall. Okay, so how did he throw you? Did he just push you or did he... Oh, no, no, he gave me the elbow, smashed right across, and he just did the fall. <laughs> and how old were you? I was, what, 16, 16, 17, somewhere around there. And were you teaming up with the, the Saturday Night Wrestling Circuit because of the theatricality or the paycheck? Uh, well, there wasn't much pay. Uh, I got involved with it through boxing, and uh, a local promoter needed somebody to pick the guys up at the airport as they, and take them to the hotel. And they couldn't be seen together, as it were, you know, so I used to do that. And uh, so I started training with them, and uh, they'd work out in the afternoons and that, and myself and my buddy Byron Long, we would uh, go in and we'd also wrestle. And there was a convention called the Mass Marble. And that is, if they didn't have enough guys to fill the card, then whoever was in the first or second match went into the mask and came on in the last match as from parts unknown, blah, blah, blah. Went into the mask, you mean? <coughs> oh, yeah, the full head the mask. The mask, okay. You know, the Mass Marble. So we were in Bell Island on this particular night. Byron and I had worked out a number of routines. And one of our guys who was going into the mask got hurt. And Bob O'Neill, the promoter, said, Walter, you've been working with Byron. You go into the mask. And I went into the mask. And <laughs> it was a very short match. <laughs> then my mother found out. <laughs> and that was the end of my wrestling career. OK, but we're talking about the theatricality here. So yeah. did you have some sense of the moves and what to expect? Oh, God, yes. Oh, no, no. We had worked. We had worked really hard. We had good routines. And in, in wrestling, the victim controls everything. Nothing is done without the victim giving consent. And there are various ways you give consent. It's either the squeeze or the water or whatever. So uh, I knew those. And we knew the falls. And when we started, uh, we would lie on the ground, and one of the guys would just take our hands and hold us up, take us an inch or two from the ground and drop us. And eventually, you got to the point where you were f full standing, and you could go down and take the fall. And uh, so, yeah, we knew the routines. It was great fun. It was, it was play acting. It was play acting. It was great fun. So that was your theater school? That was my, <laughs> that was my theater school. That and being lucky enough I went to a school called Bishopfield College, which was sort of the Newfoundland version of an English public school. From grade 3 to grade 11, my grandfather was determined that I would get a good education, so he paid the dollar fifty a month out of his $50 a month paycheck to get me into the school. 
And concurrent with that, this, this crazy band of actors arrived from England. They would come in September and they'd do a show a week right through until the week before Easter. This is St. John's. This is in St. John's and this is in 53, 54. They were in my school auditorium. And so I would, of course, during lunch times or at recess times or please miss may I leave the room, go down and I would watch this stuff. And one day this man came and tapped me on the shoulder. What are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just watching. This was Leslie Yeo. And his wife, Maura Fenwick, was in the company. Gilly Fenwick, I uh, mean, was in the company. Hilary Vernon, Charles Jarrett, Alex McCowan. These were unbelievable people. They came over on the Furnace Willie line. They rehearsed three plays on the boat. So the Furnace Willie line is, Furnace is the... Furnace Willie was the... The cruise uh, line, the, 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 Yeah, the, the transatlantic, yeah. And they would rehearse on board, and then they'd come, and they'd do weekly rep. And uh, Leslie wrote a wonderful book called, I think, A Thousand and One Opening Nights, about that whole experience. And uh, they eventually uh, took shows to Halifax, which was the beginning of creating the need for Neptune. Right. And these people, and, and half of them stayed in Canada and became... And what years are we fabric. talking here? We're talking 50, 52, 53, 54, 55. And they were eventually killed by television. Television was introduced to Newfoundland and that sort of killed it. And how many years in total did they come over? On the I line? think it was about six or seven. Wow. I think so, yeah. And they could, amazing. financially, they could make a go of it? <sighs> well, I in Leslie's book, which I have way back, uh, he actually has the detailed accounts for one season. And I forget now what they were paying, but, you know, it was nothing. It was nothing, but they did everything. Joe Shaw, oh, I remember Joe Shaw off stage. They were doing, they were doing uh, The Rivals, I think. And he had a quick change. And in the dress rehearsal, which I saw, he, uh, he said, uh, Oliver, Oliver Gordon was directing, he says, Oliver, I can't make this change. I need help. Oliver says, oh, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Opening, Joe's off stage. I told you I couldn't make this bloody change. <laughs> and every year they did, every year at Christmas, they did a pantomime. The afternoons was the clean, the evening was the filthy. They did the absolute traditional English panto with all the double entendres at night, the whole bit. And then in the new year, they did a review, political, topical, and the first one was called Screech, after the famous Newfoundland rum. The next year was more Screech. The next year was still more Screech. And once again, still more Screech. <laughs> they, were, they were marvelous. George Patton Foster, the designer, painted his sets in our gym. I used to watch this. They were so generous. So generous. And where else did they go? Or did they only go to St. John's? They did St. John's. And then they found that if they put their stuff on the train and went to Halifax, they could sail out of Halifax on a different schedule. And it was easier for them to get it. So that's when they started. They did a couple of years of touring where they finished off the season in Halifax. And Leslie Yale was the actor manager. So he was. Speak. He and Oliver Gordon owned the company and ran the company. Yeah. So it really was a 19th century idea of a company run Absolute. by actor managers, and absolutely, you figure out the tour and yep. you live in you small, dingy hotel rooms, well, yeah. but you make it all work. Yeah, you made friends for life, and I was so grateful to Leslie that. Uh, Years later, I got to hire him to direct noises off for me in Vancouver. Oh, what a time that was. So was you watched them rehearse? Oh, yeah. So was this your, your entree, your entree this, into theater? I think this really was my entree into the theater. This is where the magic and the transformation happened. Did they ever Did get you up and say, join? No, no, no. But uh, I think seeing that and then get, doing the wrestling and that, that really sort of marked me for life. <laughs> but it was so great. I mean, I got to work with Joe Shaw later, you know. I got to work with Leslie Yeo later. Hilary Vernon passed away, unfortunately. But, yeah, they were, they were great. And a uh, little sidebar. Uh, in that same school, uh, and this would be, oh, God, earlier, about 1950, somewhere around there, I would go down. Somebody was in the auditorium, and there was this lady, a little small woman, and there's this young guy, and he had a hat stand. 
on the stage. And they had these hats. And he would come out and he would take a hat and do a speech from Shakespeare. I thought, wow, that's something. A couple of days later, I come out. He's there and he's got a lectern. And he's wearing this wig. And, uh, and he's doing Mark Twain. And it's this little American soldier, Hal Holbrook. Are you ready? <laughs> Sylvia Wig is helping, and he married a girl from Newfoundland, Ruby Mercer. He was in the American Air Force or Army in the base at Fort Pepperell, and here he was. And when he got out of the Army, and when he went, they took off in an old Chev, he and Ruby, and he went all through the States, touring the States, doing this, the Shakespeare's hats and, and uh, this, uh, this uh, Mark Twain Tonight. Yep, and I saw him do Mark Twain tonight in 1960, and he had me on the edge of my seat. Oh, my first year, uh, my first year at the Playhouse in Fredericton, where we used to book acts in as well. I called him and reminded him of my days at Bishop Field and tried to book him in, but he was doing New York and <laughs> long gigs, so never got him.